As if things weren't weird enough, now we have Seth in space. This is Seth's Star Sector review, explore the cosmos, ruin everything. Let's get into it. Hey, hey, people. Seth here. Star Sector is an open world space strategy game about selling heroin and illegally harvested kidneys on the black market, making money off misery, disruption, and political unrest, and ambushing trade. Ah, so this is a pharmaceutical company simulator in space. Love it. Convoys in deep space just to watch a planet descend into chaos. I've been playing this game on and off for years now. It's amazing, yet I don't hear many people talk about it. Star Sector is a massive project done entirely by four people, and it's had updates for about nine years now. Well, gotta love those passion projects, and it's sort of a testament to terribly run major corporations that they can't seem to put out these passion project games. Though it's pretty fascinating to me, I would be curious to know how much they would have made over this 10 years if they had been a triple A studio dev versus what they made as the devs for people working exclusively on their indie game star sector, right? On one hand, they won't have as much infrastructure and support as like an EA uh, or an Activision. But on the other hand, they get to keep you know, a much larger percentage of the profits. You know, imagine if just 1% or 2% of the sales of, say, Call of Duty went to a dev, how much would that dev make? Each one getting closer to their dream goal of simulating a living, breathing galaxy. Story! Okay, nobody gives a shit, so I'm gonna be quick. Right, so in Star Sector, humanity figured out faster than light travel. We colonized thousands of worlds, spanning hundreds of galaxies, using the relays from Mass Effect, which were the only practical way of crossing galaxies. They were the only practical way, until suddenly, nobody knows exactly why, all the gate systems went dead. We could no longer reach the rest of humanity. This event is referred to as the Collapse and marks the end of the prosperous Domain Era. In an isolated galaxy 206 cycles after the Collapse, our story takes place. Common humanity has been replaced with ambition, desperation, and conflict. Our few yeah, this is actually really fascinating and one of the things that we, we often forget, and I've talked about this in my Warhammer videos, when you have the collapse of an information distribution system, the problem is, is that you don't really know that the collapse has happened. Example, let's say that something were to happen and all internet in the world was to go down or all telecommunications. Well, how long would it take for you to know that the outage is not in your neighborhood or just in your city or just in your state, but is in fact worldwide? Think about where you get your information that isn't via an electronic or internet-based device. That is actually pretty troubling. But even if you think of previous eras, right? The, the collapse of Rome, how long would it take before you got word of the you know, a dissolution of the empire. It might have been months, weeks, or even years before that information made its way to the average, say, Roman citizen in Gaul or in the reaches of the provinces. Future is bleak and we don't- All they would know is that one day that the regular shipment of the Roman administrators or regular communications from Rome would have just stopped and they don't know is it because there is no one sitting on the throne there is no rome or is it just because of pirates uh had intercepted uh letters or a blockade by a hostile force or something else right you just don't know what's happening when the collapse hits your communication your information systems don't know what tomorrow might hold for us welcome to this this is also, why information warfare, when people talk about it, it's so emphasized, right? Imagine if you are, let's say, the Iraqi army in the Iraq in the first Iraq war, or the second Iraq war, and you're a brigade, you are expected to fight, and one day you wake up and all communication and supplies from headquarters are gone. You may not even know if there's still a war taking place. Maybe that's, maybe it's because that they surrendered. Maybe it's because the war is over. You just don't know. And that's why if you can win the communications and the information war 
and in so confusion, you're going to paralyze the actual fighting ability and resisting ability of your enemies. Star Sector. Basically, everything's a piece of shit. We're in the galactic version of a Dark Ages, but it's super fun. Nobody remembers how to make anything anymore, mainly because of DRM and copyright laws. I'm not kidding, that is the actual in-game reason. We can't reliably make new ships or machinery because all the corporations put copy protection on their design chips. Anyway, in the chaos- Yeah, you laugh. This is uh, absolutely something that's happening even in modern warfare. If you were to design something like the F-35, these systems are so complex and their designs are so proprietary that in most cases, the military has no active duty personnel that can perform maintenance beyond a certain level. And the only way to maintain these systems is to send them back to the contractor. While this is highly profitable, in the event of an actual war, you would experience a tremendous breakdown of resources if, again, you could somehow stop that gear from making its way back to Lockheed Martin or the original manufacturer. So that followed, everybody broke off into their own respective factions and keep dick-waving each other. But ultimately, nobody can consolidate enough power to wipe out or unify the competition. However, they didn't account for one thing. You, thrown into the space sandbox, you begin as nothing but a pilot with a small fleet. Insignificant in a scale of things, but given time, practice, and some high-level maneuvers, you could be the one person to unite the sector, or reduce it to the Stone Age. Every faction is unique in their motivations, and it generally pays to be nice to them. That is, if they can be reasoned with. In no particular order, these are the hegemony, which represent the combined remains of law and order from the Domain Era. Uh, okay, shout out to the McDonald's. That's an awesome, I think. Back it up, back it up. Let's see if we can identify. Oh god, too far back, too far back. Yeah. Yeah, baby, that is an awesome. I don't mean that it is awesome. I mean that class, that chassis of battle mech is the awesome with two P P PPC cannons and some serious rocket pods on the shoulders. It's pretty iconic. No, wait, I might be wrong. I might be a mauler actually. Anyway, the point is McDonald's is not the, the entity you want to have in possession of a battle mech. Law and order from the Domain Era, the Persian League, which said fuck taxes and broke off from the hegemony, the Sindrian how a league can function without some sort of tax system. They must have some sort of dumb workaround. Diktat, a military dictatorship, which also said fuck taxes and broke off from the hegemony. Try <laughs> Corporation, which represents the R&D business interest of Tritachion Incorporated, the uh, mega corporation uh. responsible for pioneering unregulated AI technology. Conversely, there's the Luddic Church, who are subhumans that believe the collapse was God's punishment for for molesting the stars and that artifact. Interesting. Interesting that you can have subhumans as a playable faction or a faction. Uh, I don't even know what would constitute a subhuman. Maybe just they mean a regular human who isn't cybernetically enhanced? Facial intelligence is literally electronic Satan. These are considered the moderates. Then there's the Luddic Path, a sect of fundamentalist space jihadists that believe the answer to man's technological hubris is rampant terrorism. Everyone hates the Luddic Path, and the Luddic Path hates everyone. Well, that seems straightforward. Generally, of course, these extremist beliefs tend to either burn out very quickly because they end up with no allies they can turn to, or they suddenly begin to moderate. Oftentimes, what you see are things like the Iranian Revolution or the Taliban, who, when they begin to govern their country, they maintain their extremist rhetoric, but their actions do not align with it any longer. Uh, Communist China get a great example talk frequently about the worker's paradise and maintain all the trappings of a communist system, but in practice they engage in an extreme, almost eye-watering level of broadly unregulated capitalism. And finally, pirates. These are self-explanatory and quite consistent with their ideology. You have stuff I want, so I'm going to kill you. Or you don't. I'm going to kill you anyway for the hell of it. Your relations and interactions with each of these factions will determine the fate of the galaxy. Anyway, gameplay. Everything's a wreck. Tensions are high, but most of all, there's profit to be made. Mostly everything in Star Sector revolves around money or credits. These are effectively space bitcoins and are universally accepted everywhere. Most of your time. 
Gotta love some space Bitcoins. Hey, listen, look at the bright side. One of the things that makes Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies so appealing as a store of value is their relative efficiency. You have to think previously, if you didn't want to depend on a single state's currency, because remember, whether you like it or not, owning a currency is in fact an investment in that state. So if you, for example, owned Venezuelan boulevards because you were a big believer in the robust oil reserves of Venezuela, boy howdy was that a bad call. In contrast, if you held your wealth in the United States dollar, right, that has historically, or over the past 100 years or so, been a great call. That currency has maintained its value as and its status as the global reserve currency. But if you didn't want to pin your hopes to a single nation's currency, right? Instead, you wanted some sort of neutral, highly liquid, easily exchangeable store of value. Your options were pretty limited. You had, in some cases, uh, commodities, right? You could buy, for example, barrels of oil that you can sell for Russian rubles. You could sell them for, you know, Saudi dinar. You could sell them for US dollars. Or, but of course, storing oil is hard and oil tends to go bad. So you ha unless you have a warehouse, crude oil, and a lot of shipping trucks, that's not a great place to hoard your wealth. Other examples of wealth holding uh, devices or assets are uh, real estate. And in that case, oftentimes you see in major urban areas, condos and townhouses are bought by foreign investors who don't really want to grow their money, but merely want to hold an asset, oftentimes outside of their home country, as sort of a hedge against instability. So they will sit there and say, okay, I am a Chinese business person, and I want to make sure that I have wealth that the Chinese state cannot touch. So in order to diversify, I will purchase real estate in Toronto. And this is fine, but the asset is so expensive, one, that it needs to be maintained because it's real estate, but two, you have to pay taxes on it every single year. And the more people do it, the higher the value goes, the more you pay in taxes. So it is a phenomenally expensive way to store large amounts of value. Finally, finally, you have gold. Gold is the classic historic example of a neutral currency for about the entire century of the 1800s. Uh, and for large portions of human history, currencies were l either backed by gold or literally were minted gold. The earliest currencies are actually just the state sealing a fixed amount of gold, stating, yes, we, the government of the Assyrian king, declare that this is indeed one, they didn't have ounces, but one ounce of gold, and they stamp their picture of the king on it. And they go, this is how we know for sure. That's why old coins tend to look a little janky is because they had to be measured out and they weren't about looking good. They were about ensuring they had the exact right amount of metal, gold, silver, etc. But gold has its own problems. And again, gold's nice because it's not going to rust. It's not going to degrade. It's a noble metal and doesn't really oxidize. But, but huge problem. It is so heavy. And while an individual can carry a little bag of gold coins on their belt, if you wanted to store millions of dollars of wealth in gold, you would also need a warehouse, you would need security guards, you would need very, very reliable truck drivers. And if you want to pay someone in gold, well, you better be prepared to send a secure shipment. And remember, if you want to be paid in gold, you need to have some big, powerful scales. All of these are huge logistical problems, and that's the most efficient way, one of the most efficient ways of holding your money. That is what cryptocurrency potentially solves. And I'm not a cryptocurrency guru or evangelist, but the fact that you only have to pay, for example, Ethereum, you only have to pay the gas fees, and you can hold millions of Ethereum or millions of Bitcoin and engage in large transactions not dependent on any given government. In fact, you can hold Bitcoin, you can hold millions of dollars of Bitcoin on a flash drive, right? As you've known, someone has a hundred million dollars in Bitcoin in a cold storage wallet in a landfill somewhere because he threw it out because, I don't know, his mom was mad at him or something. It is pretty wild to think about. Time, as with real life, will be spent figuring out how to- That the people who are like cryptocurrency is the future, to me, that is probably the number one 
thing, the number two appeal of cryptocurrency, or of number one of cryptocurrency, probably number two of blockchain make as much money as possible. You can see why I love this game. It runs in my blood. Your starting fleet is very small. You can't really fight most enemies, but you are fast and burn very little fuel to get around. The only means of interstellar travel in Star Sector is by diving into hyperspace and burning through metric tons of antimatter fuel to reach distant stars. So the size and composition of your fleet is important for fuel economy. You should always watch your fuel tanks and pray you never run dry while in the middle of deep space. Because once you go dry, your fleet will be pulled into the nearest gravity well, which, if you're unlucky, might be a red giant. If you're very unlucky, a black hole. So at the start, I recommend you do planetary surveys and exploration contracts. These don't require much investment, just patience and nerves of steel. Sometimes while exploring deep space, you might hear distress signals. Uh, we ignore- Uh oh. Stress signals sound like a euphemism for a trap. This is, well, this is one of the problems. This is actually, uh, if you think about it, exactly what hunters do when they make a uh, call, right? Oftentimes, hunting calls come in two flavors. The first flavor is that sounds like a mate, an available mate of the animal you're hunting. This would be like a duck call, right? It's telling ducks, hey, there's other ducks here. Ducks just tend to want to be around each other. This birds flock, etc., etc. The other one is the sound of prey, and you sound like a wounded prey animal. And so that draws, of course, predators. Or those. The irony, of course, is that you aren't really the you aren't the prey. You are an even bigger predator. Just ignore them. Contracts are offered to you by intel frequencies from different factions, businesses, and planet administrators. How close you are to the nearest communications relay will decide how quickly you hear about it, since transmissions travel in real time. You should generally be very quick about grabbing these. Space is busy, and contracts can be withdrawn or taken by somebody else without notice. With money to spare, you can go ahead and actually invest into your own ships. And let me tell you, there's a lot of ships to choose from. With different roles, specifications, and hull sizes. This ranges from the smallest frigates to capital class ships, which take up most of the screen. It doesn't end there. Every ship can be modified, outfitted, and equipped with weapons respective to the type and size of the mount. There's a lot of crazy setups. You can even make huge modifications to the hull to completely change your ship's behavior. For example, Oh man, I bet this gets wild. Is Star Sector a multiplayer game? Is everyone out there getting contracts fighting each other or like sort of like eve or is this a one player game let's say you want your cruiser to act as a makeshift carrier you can convert their cargo base to accommodate fighter squadrons instead some factions also cook up their own modifications pirates don't have top of the line equipment so they improvise for this reason the pirates capital class ship is a stolen cargo frayer ripped apart and stitched back together with as many guns as they could possibly hold <laughs> the luddock path follows the same philosophy of DIY hull mods, but they don't. Guys, if there is one thing that we have seen in the past couple of years, it's that the DIY military uh, movement is alive and well. A lot of non-state militant groups, fighters, uh, have found themselves engaging in exactly what we're talking about here. The whole DIY, uh, they call it fulfilling roles. Oftentimes, a role is something on the battlefield where you say, man, we need something that can do X. And in the for most states, they're able to sign contracts with major uh, weapons manufacturers or develop their own systems in-house. So, for example, common role is mobile fire support. This would be a large mounted uh, automatic fire weapon like a machine gun and the ability to move quickly. What in the US we use our uh, turret mounted Humvees for this role, but for non state actors like terror groups, uh, they will often use uh, converted pickup trucks. 
those pickup trucks can be converted uh, into having turrets on the back in a technical is how it's sometimes referred to. Uh, but there's even more examples. Military grade drones, unmanned aircraft technology. This is something where the US has, of course, very advanced drones with very advanced strike capabilities. But as we've seen in the conflict in Syria and Yemen, it is not uncommon to have modified commercial drones capable of dropping single, small, dumb bomb explosives onto a target. And this is often not just as effective as a Hellfire, but can be still pretty effective. Care about coming. So the, all this to say that the DIY military culture is unfortunately alive and well. Oh, oh, I forgot about the most pertinent example. And that, of course, is the IED, the Improvised Explosive Device. Normally, militaries can purchase mines activated by tripwire mines or IR mines or pressure mines. But if you can't do that or those mines are easily countered, you need to improvise. And the IEDs, it was every probably 12 months that insurgent movements would innovate, come up with a new way of detonating IEDs, and US forces a few months later would come up with a new way to counter them. Here's a good example, right? When US forces began to use mine rollers, right? Sort of a, a, a set of heavy wheels in front of a convoy that would set off pressure detonated IEDs. The uh, insurgents went to IR, infrared, activated IEDs. These are IEDs that would sense the heat of an engine and would be set off by the engine heat. Well, to counter that, what the US forces did is they developed an arm that dropped down in front of a vehicle and got really, really hot and would set off that IR sensor, right? So that it would, so that the IED would detonate prematurely. And this cycle continued again and again and again. But it's just a testament to how fast and flexible the DIY engineering culture can be when you have the pressure cooker of warfare. Coming back alive, so they take captured fuel ships, override the safety settings, and turn it into a gigantic battering ram. And it's absolutely terrifying when you realize it's burning towards you at full speed. The amount of customization is insane, and you can do this for every single ship in your fleet. Combat takes place automatically, with your fleet responding to orders to the best of their ability. They're actually quite good. Until you get a reckless officer who decides that the best defense is a good offensive ramming maneuver. However, you pilot your flagship directly. It takes some getting used to. Every ship generates flux whenever they shoot or absorb damage, so you'll have to manage or vent the extra flux into space to avoid overloading your system and leaving yourself open to attack. The same goes for enemies. As if all of this wasn't already too much to take in, every ship type has unique specializations. For example, phase class ships can't use shields. Instead, they can do this, which moves the ship safely into an alternative dimension where time flows much faster. Combine that with my favorite ship in the game, the Star Sector equivalent of Killer Queen, and you've got a ship that can turn anything into a bomb while hiding inside another dimension. I don't have- <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I, okay, there's no such thing as, well, there are other dimensions, right? There's three of them, but, you know, I don't know, this isn't, there's no part of that that's realistic. To explain shit. It just works. Combat is amazing once you figure it out. It's simultaneously the hardest and most satisfying component of the game. Luckily, your capital is not at risk. All planetary stations offer combat simulations to test your design. However, you'll need a lot more money to get to that point, so you'll need to work with the game's economic system. Yes, this game has a fully simulated real-time economy. Every colony produces, demands, and consumes different resources, and needs a constant stream of trade traffic to stay functional. Yeah, this is sometimes what's called the just-in-time manufacturing logistics the pol the policy procedure, whatever you want to call it, just-in-time logistics. And just-in-time logistics are what sort of have gotten uh, consumers into, in some ways, our current inflation problem. The idea of just-in-time logistics is that by using uh, telecommunications and very, very detailed planning and forecasting that you can manufacture that the basically the time from when a customer clicks the order that that 
their order is already en route to them somewhere in the process. So it could be already on a ship, but more likely it's already in a warehouse, already being pushed to their location because that good is so easily forecasted that sales are so in the aggregate well known that the just-in-time logistics system is already moving it to their location. An example might be you run, let's say, Target, and you know that you sell an average of 12 bath towels a week. And you know that the worst week you've ever seen is, is uh, six, and the best week you've ever had is 18. So what does that mean? That means that Target knows that on average, it needs to have 12 towels getting to Target every week, which means there's 12 towels that earmarked for your store in the warehouse where they'll be delivered Monday morning. There's probably 12 more at the port shipping container where they'll go out towards the warehouse that Monday. 12 more in the ship in China waiting to be shipped over and 12 more currently on the factory floor. Assuming, of course, there's a weak gap between each one of them. It's a little more complex than that, obviously, but that is the idea of just-in-time logistics. The problem is, is that if demand increases across the board unexpectedly, or there is any sort of disruption to any part of that system, no one has any spare inventory, right? Your warehouse only has those 12 towels. Your shipping container only is shipping 12 towels and no one has any extra to push to meet unmet demand or to compensate for supply chain disruptions. And this is, well, a really effective way to run a company. It's very efficient, right? You almost every good is, um, is sold. It is a terrible way to run a military or a state, right? The reality always gets a vote and you always want to make sure you have enough resources to weather a crisis because when the stakes are high and it's a no fail environment, such as, you know, warfare where, you know, you can't lose a war and say, oh, we'll get them next time, right? In war, there may not be a next time that you always want to make sure you have a reserve to continue to power through despite disruptions. The resources needed depend on the industry. For example, mining. Mining is very depressing, so miners consume a lot of heroin to numb the pain of being a miner. A mining colony's output stagnates if the smuggled narcotics cannot meet demand. Each time you enter a marketplace in the game, you can pull up the entire market data, see consumers, producers, market shares, and and relative prices across the sector. But making a profit isn't that easy. The open market is subject to a massive trade tariff of 30%, which can quickly cut into your margins. So we don't trade on the open market. We trade on the black market. Smuggling shit planet to planet completely sidesteps paying taxes and lets you deal in highly illegal contraband like combat mechs, AI cores, harvested organs, and every drug you can think of. However, the life of a smuggler Smuggler isn't that easy. Smuggle too much, and your suspicion level increases, which means Guys, this is also a really good illustration. Not that this is going to be an, a guide on how to commit crimes in Star Sector, but in in Star Sector, uh, prosecutors, right? They are frankly overwhelmed, and they've always pretty much been overwhelmed. That is why so often petty crime has little to no consequences. And for things that are more resource intensive to investigate, for example, a smuggling operation or a gray market operation, or things that just aren't that salacious, again, uh, 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 fake Rolexes, for example, all right? Is that anybody's enforcement priority? No. So unless you're selling fake Rolexes, like in front of the police station, Nobody's gonna say anything. And even if you did, right? Let's say a police said, I know you're selling fake Rolexes because a real Rolex isn't gonna be $100. They say, okay, we'll prove it. Well, how do you prove it? We, you, you, what are you gonna do? Have Rolex Corporation send one of their employees down to verify the, the, that the Rolex is really what they say it is? Um, are you going to have an accountant um, you know, testify for you know, $800 an hour as an expert that there's no documentation behind this Rolex and, you know, how are you going to do it? And is it going to be worth it to nab 
$600 in Rolexes? It's just not. So the danger of being prosecuted for a crime, particularly a crime that's relatively, that doesn't produce um, angry or outraged public or an angry or outraged victim, it doesn't really do, enforcement is sporadic. Oftentimes when it happens, it's meant to make an example of someone or it's targeted to someone who they suspect of being a much more serious criminal, but this is what they can get them on. You know, this is why, of course, if you look at who gets prosecuted for, say, large scale frauds like uh, Ponzi schemes, they, oftentimes Ponzi schemes go on uh, even after it's fairly obvious that they are criminals, that as less the Ponzi scheme takes millions and millions of dollars in, it's not going to warrant any prosecutor's attention because the prosecutions are so resource intensive. And this is what you often see here. At the end of the day, right, if someone needs a, you know, a harvested organ, right, in this, in Star Sector, I don't think there's a black market for organs, but in Star Sector, you have a, you know, black market for organs, people are happy they get organs, they pay the market rate, and nobody's going to the cops about it, right, and as long as no one gets killed, then nobody's all that worried about enforcing it. Troll fleets are more likely to do random stop searches. Sometimes they find nothing. Sometimes they find all of your contraband, destroy it, and hurt your reputation. I still remember the moment I was amazed by this game. I was about to be stop searched by a random patrol, so I thought, hey, let's just eject all of my drugs out into space. So I got stop searched. They found nothing, as expected. Then the patrol officer said, hey, you're all clean. And by the way, we scanned some cargo pods floating around nearby and you know what they're filled with illegal shit but it's not yours right so we'll just confiscate these and destroy them this game thinks of everything so to smuggle effectively let me teach you the tricks of a trade which conveniently are the same tools you'll use for navigating space number one in civilized space everyone has to have their transponder on this is your fleet identification it's illegal to go without it but it makes it very obvious when you're doing shady business the detection range of your fleet depends on your surroundings. A nearby asteroid field is the perfect place to hide. Once inside, we kill our transponder and go dark. Going dark means running engines on minimal power, which reduces your heat signature and makes you very hard to detect. Doing this, we quietly approach planets and do business anonymously, so the authorities can't trace it back to us. Number two, if you get jumped by patrols or spotted, hit the emergency burn and outrun them. If they're too close, there's a chance they'll try and fire off an interdiction, which temporarily fries your burn drives. If this happens, you're screwed, but we've- So, here's the thing to remember, is that laundering eh, is the act of, of course, taking something illegal and making it appear legal is a really common practice. And we think of it as money laundering, right? When you take, uh, you know, the Breaking Bad style, you have uh, stacks full of $20 bills, and you have to turn them into legal tender that you can put in a bank account and buy a house with. And that's a pretty complicated process. But lots of other things can get laundered too, especially if there's something that can be sold legally, but it does not, is not being done so. For example, selling stolen goods, right? Getting stolen goods to appear legitimate is another laundering type of process. And this would be best done, for example, if there was a legal route to trade, you know, harvested organs or recreational drugs. If that were to exist, then what you would want is to have a neutral world where black market smugglers can arrive and gray market dealers can purchase it for a lower premium than they would get selling direct to consumers. But those gray market users are able to ensure a veneer of legitimacy, for example, through fabricated paperwork or just through legitimate paperwork that no authorities ever follow up on. Again, if nobody's dropping dead, the authorities have bigger fish to fry than whether or not the uh, chain of custody of your those you know off-world uh, hearts or kidneys are really as legitimate as they say. This is super common. Think about it. Does the hospital really want to look that hard of where the provenance of that kidney is? Probably not in these worlds. And so that's why you usually have what's often called the gray market. 
And that is these entities that exist that can do business in the black market, launder it, and sell it on the white market. We've got another trick up our sleeves. Number three, transverse jumping. The most essential skill you can learn as a fleet commander, which lets you jump right into hyperspace without using a jump point. It's highly illegal, it takes a while to charge, but it lets you dab on patrols before they can reach you. With all of these tools, you should be able to make fat stacks of cash. Now, of course, regular smuggling is fine and dandy, but the big profits are taken from trade contracts, as they often pay several times the market value, provided you can deliver on time or just hang around the local bar at the end of the day it turns out the best vehicle for human business is alcohol this game is constant management planning and ca yeah this is also true there's a lot of cultures where alcohol and a willingness to drink is seen as a sign of intimacy and honesty so knocking back a couple of drinks with your future business uh, partners is essential to doing business calculation sometimes things don't go as planned or get thrown off by factors outside your control but these can also be exploited for your own gain let's say a system has been targeted by pirates smuggling is rampant trade convoys are going missing this is terrible however it's also terribly profitable for you the more desperate a system gets the cheaper they'll sell their exports and the higher they'll pay for imports to stabilize the market you could even go one step fervor. Why not take advantage of a trade surplus, buy off the excess, and smuggle them back to the pirates? Pirates have terrible trade routes and will gladly pay good money for marines, mechs, and narcotics. War and conflict is just business after all. In this game- Wait, 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 sorry. I'm, I'm not clear. Okay, so a country- uh, 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 uh. Blockade. Oh, I see. So a blockaded world who can't sell their goods will sell them to you at a- at great prices and then he takes them and sells them to the very pirates who are blockading the world okay this is actually an updated version of a classic move of warlords since basically time immemorial and that is demanding tribute it's just demanding tribute with extra steps that warlord demands resources to fund their further conquests and the world uh, or the village under the warlord's thumb of course it gives tribute to ensure that the warlord does not destroy their village and burn it to the ground. Morality doesn't pay. Opportunistic pragmatism does. When your business relations sours or ceases to be profitable, offer to take the bounty contract for that same group of pirates, blast their station into orbit, and receive even more money and praise from the faction that posted the contract. You'll come- Oh man, this reminds me of a classic move in Afghanistan. This is, of course, when an Afghan informant would come to you and say, guess what? I know a Taliban member and they have all sorts of drugs they are growing, refining, and dealing to fund their military operations. And of course, the US almost always will say, oh my gosh, tell me their location, show me where they are. And some, you know, Green Beret team shows up, hits the compound, sure enough, weapons, drugs, all of it, and they roll up the bad guys and fly off and give that informant a nice little payday. What they missed is that the informant is another competing drug business. This is true also in the US. Who do you think is the number one provider of tips on major narcotics dealers? Of course, they're competitors. They're competitors. There's no better protection than being an informant or the feds, but you just have to sell out some actual dealers, and boy howdy, is it easy to do when they are the ones competing with you. Back a celebrated hero, and lower ranking officials will generally stay out of your way. You're a smuggler, you're doing illegal shit, but you're also helping us out, so we'll turn a blind eye for now. You can also do the same for the Luddick Path. Who knew that arming radical space terrorists could be so profitable? This game is amazing, and with the latest update, you can go even fervor. With so much wealth and power, why not start exploring the far sectors of space? It's mostly filled with dead rocks and all sorts of natural and unnatural cosmic horrors like neutron stars, black holes, and even worse, the re- Okay, this is creepy. 
But somewhere in all that chaos, you might get lucky. You might find a planet that's actually good, not too much unlike Earth. So you run a survey, send an expedition, and hey, what do you know? It is a damn good planet. So why not colonize it? Start your own colony, form your own faction, invest back into the colony, attract more people and grow the population, build heavy batteries, orbital battle stations, and patrols to secure your domain. Expand, expand aggressively. Announce that your station is now an open port. Profit from your own black market. Start an organ harvest. Mm, yep, like we talked about, the best way, of course, is always going to be to be run your own gray market. And that's what he's describing. A legitimate government that is willing to launder these items. So now, when you purchase an organ, it is certified as ethically sourced from Seth Seth World Republic. God, I suck at naming. Yep, Seth World Republic organs are the cleanest ethically har harvested organs. Maybe you even lie and just say, hey, these organs are actually grown in vats. They're not from people. Meanwhile, in your other port, our organ harvesters from around the globe can come and sell their organs. Sure, they don't get the full market price, but it's safe and it's legitimate because it's the gray market. Sting operation. Take so much of the illegally harvested organ market share that other factions get jealous and try to fuck you over with red tape, bureaucracy, and trade disruptions to prevent you from getting ahead. Subvert their plans by bribing their commanders. Become an industrial powerhouse. Get targeted by pirates for being too prosperous. Get targeted by the space jihad for being too industrial. Get targeted by the hegemony because they realize why you're so successful. Because your colony isn't run by humans. No, all this time your colony has been run by an alpha core, an artificial intelligence that overshadows the decision-making abilities of any human. In Star Sector, using an AI is completely illegal. Using an alpha level AI is extremely fucking illegal. But as long as you keep bribing their military, they can't do anything. Eventually, decide that having an AI isn't worth the trouble. Try and pull it out. But you can't because it's missing. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dad. Oh man, you give the order to quietly disconnect the AI core governing M. Becky and remove it from the control bunker to be placed in secure storage. The tech in charge of carrying out the job reports and baffled the core is nowhere to be found. Dave, I'm afraid a call I can't, from an anomalous can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Realize that the AI already anticipated this. Get blackmailed by your own AI, who threatens to tell every faction in the sector that you've been using AI technology if you try and disconnect him. Do it anyway. Plunge your empire into total war. Raid the other factions and steal their copyright protected blueprints. Watch them get obliterated by their own ship designs. Cripple their military. Propose a sea- Jesus. This is, this is some dark madness, uh, but this is actually, so, okay, the actual techno-futurists, yes, general AI seems weird and scary and unpredictable, sort of like human beings, but specific AI or narrow AI is the a time term for an AI that is really good at, what, at learning about one narrow thing. For example, playing the game Go is a very simple example. The question that ever on everyone's mind about the future is how good can narrow AI get narrow machine learning? We've seen it has a phenomenal ability to hold people's attention, like the algorithms that govern, say, TikTok. And it, it, it can definitely respond to simple feedback where there's a simple metric for success, i.e. optimize for watch time. The machine itself, the AI itself, doesn't understand why it wants to show you these videos. It just knows that statistically, people that watch videos X, Y, and Z are also likely to watch A, B, and C. So now, the question is, could it do something like, say, logistics? Could it be trained to, um, like, hire employees? Could it be trained to serve sentencing? Could it be trained to set interest rates for your economy? These are sort of the deeper questions about what can an AI do? And to me, I don't think AIs will ever run officially 
a country or an economy or anything of at scale that's complex and deals with human lives. But I imagine AI advisors will get better and better over time and become more and more trusted over time. And that is what I'm most curious about. What happens if you are a, a, the you know, COO of Walmart, but you have an ultra powerful AI that says, hey, here are the six best locations for your new warehouses. And here's the math on why I think so, right? We've run all these models and this is what's up. Who are you as a COO with a lot of busy meetings and nonsense to question these decisions? Peace fire. Receive no reply. Order a saturation bombardment on every core world. Condemn millions to their death. Win. Decommission every AI core and throw them into the sun and consider what you've done. Then put one final bullet in the chamber. Hold the barrel against your temple and shoot. Star Sector. It's a lot of fun. Whoa. Fun. Surely, Seth, there's nothing more to say, and you've covered everything. Wrong. This game also has its own active modding scene, which adds dozens oh God. of new ships, weapons, and factions into the mix. There's even mods which merge them all together, letting new factions trade and interact with the rest. After finishing the base game, mods can keep you entertained with an entirely new game altogether. Sometimes the developers even incorporate mods into the main code if they're that good. Oh yeah, this game also works on Mac and Linux. This is Probably one of the best products I've ever bought, and it only cost me 15 bucks. They yeah, you have to think, if you have four devs and you sell a million copies, that means, and you, the, the, remember the cost, what makes video games so good as a product is that the distribution cost is zero, right? Movies, you have to, you know, old school films, you had to physically copy the films and send them to studios. Now in the digital era, of course, they still probably pay a huge licensing fee, but it doesn't actually cost money, right? Sort of like broadcasting a pay-per-view. It doesn't actually cost you more money to get into another household, yet you can charge every single household. So if you have four devs and you can sell a million copies of Star Sector at 15 bucks a pop, even after some trivial distribution fees, which you may not even have if you buy it from starsector.com, Distribution cost zero, all of that money goes directly into your pocket. So, what does that mean? That means those four devs could potentially stand to make, what's that, 12, uh, uh, two, three, four million dollars? A lifetime's worth of income if you can, of course, sell a million copies of a game, which is a non trivial factor, but you know, two million people viewed this video and can't get much bigger endorsement than, than Seth here. Hey, make you use some old ass website from the 2000s to get your CD key and download link. But hey, it works. I Yes, and this is probably because that was programmed by the developers themselves. They probably pay only like the 2% credit card fee, right? Imagine selling it through Steam. Steam probably takes 15, 20% of your game sales. This is a great decision. And these devs, as you can see, going all in on making this game awesome is worth it because it keeps giving them, it keeps making them money. I can't really complain about something I've played for several hundred hours, nor something that keeps getting updates yearly. My only criticism is that chasing enemies or getting into a fight can take a long time if you're flying the larger ships. But again, this is something I fixed with a single mod. In an industry where you're piled on constantly with mediocrity, garbage, and bloated design, this is something put out by a few guys that puts AAA studios to shame. I give Give it a 10 out of 10. I'm completely biased and I don't care. Yeah, this is, again guys, you have to think of the, the even a mediocre game that is distributed directly by the creators. Now obviously you gotta be pretty, you gotta be pretty brilliant to design a game, market it, sell it, and distribute it, right? That's not easy to do. You have to understand the whole process. But even a mediocre game, again, think to yourself, if you sell your indie game for a dollar and you can get a million people to download it, then you have probably made, I'm going to say, eight to nine hundred thousand dollars if you can sell it directly. That's the hard part, though, is getting people to download it. Think about this is why influencers can often make a lot of money is because think of that about just reaching 10,000 people. If you can get 1% of them to purchase a product that makes $10, right? 
right? Or make, you know, if you can get 1% of them, to, yeah. Eh, oh God, my math is so bad. Uh, you're talking about thousands of dollars, right? And $10,000, 10,000 people is nothing in the scale of influencers. But if you can convert a thousand of them to be, uh, to purchase a product, then you're talking about thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. It's huge. The economy at this scale is tremendous. Star Sector is a beautiful game and I thoroughly recommend it. Go buy it. And if you're not sure, go try it. Here's my actual CD key. There's downloads below. You can smack it in there. Enjoy. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. A warm thanks to the many members of a Merchants Guild generously funding and bankrolling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Have a good day. Yeah, you guys should definitely check out Seth and his Patreon. It's awesome. Good one. All right, roll the credits. Oh, nice. And a Cowboy Bebop reference. Dude, love it. Let's see. Wow, that is a lot of credits. Let's just zoom to the end. Nope, still more Cowboy Bebop. Love it. Love it, guys. Guys, that was an awesome video. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, I'll see you guys later.